Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to VSPG. Today, um, we have a presentation from Dr. Rosalie Tostevin from the University of Cape Town, Cape Town in South Africa. Next week, we'll have a presentation from Kelsey Moore, who just started her uh, postdoc at um, in Baltimore at um, Johns Hopkins University. So join for that. that that'll be good. Um, and I'll go ahead and introduce Rosalie Forrest. And Rosalie, you can start sharing your screen so we're ready to go. Um, so Dr. Rosalie Tostevin is a sedimentary geochemist with a wide range of interests spanning uh, a large range of geologic time. She has worked on a variety of paleoenvironment and life-related questions from banded iron formations to the coevolution of Earth's surface redox landscape and animal life, to the development of eukaryote, early eukaryotes and modern natural environments and lab-grown microbial cultures. Rosalie, Rosalie received her bachelor's degree from the University of Cambridge and continued there for her master's with Pro Professor Alexandra Turchin, studying the sulfur cycle with sulfur isotope studies and modeling techniques. She receives her PhD from the University of College London with professors Graham Shields and Rachel Wood, who is at the University of Edinburgh. And that was focused on tracking oxygen levels during the early evolution of animal life using trace elements in carbonate rock. Afterwards, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Otago studying sulfur cycling and acid mine drainage, and then at the University of Oxford studying cult lab cultured microbes and trace elements and lab precipitated minerals while also lecturing at the university. Today, she continues her research with the grad students as senior lecturer at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Thank you, Rosalie, for joining us, and we're really excited to hear from you. So I'm going to go ahead and pass, pass it over to you. Cool. Thank you very much, Alex. Um... And congratulations to you too, because I believe you passed your qual exam this week. Um, and thank you for organizing this series. It was a real lifeline during COVID. And I'm glad you've continued with it. Um, I'm sorry I don't join live more. It's 5 p.m. in South Africa, which is just a, a very difficult time um, for me. But I do, I do enjoy catching up on YouTube. Um, so yeah, it's a pleasure to be able to speak to you today. And I'm gonna be talking about microbial reefs as oxygen oases on the early earth. Um, the first part of my talk, I'm just gonna review some um, background and some old work that came out of my PhD. And then the new work um, for the last two thirds of my talk is um, really all the work of Aidan Wilton, who is my master's student that submitted his thesis last week. Um, yeah, so I'll, okay. Um, so you're probably all familiar with this famous cartoon from Tim Lyons' um, review paper, just highlighting the major events in Earth's oxygenation history. Um, so very simply, there was very um, little or below 10 to the minus five of present atmospheric levels of oxygen in the atmosphere in the Archean. And then there was a rise to low but detectable levels around 2.5 to 2.3 billion years ago um, around the Archean Proterozoic boundary. But levels remained low, exactly how low is debatable, but I think we all agree that they were lower than today through most of the Mesoproterozoic. Um, and then there was a second jump towards modern like oxygen concentrations at the end of the Neoproterozoic or in the early Phanerozoic. There's no shortage of controversy, but I'm going to focus on this second oxygenation event, um, the rise from low levels towards modern um, high levels of oxygen. So this is just a zoomed in um, bit of the geological timescale here. It's the Neoproterozoic and the Paleozoic, so just a few hundred million years. Um, and this comes from a review paper I wrote with Ben Mills a couple of years ago, and we were trying to pull together um, all of the emerging geochemical proxy records, um, which all seemed to be telling um, different stories about the, the timing and the dynamics of Earth's oxygenation at this time. Uh, so Ben is a, a modeler, and he made this um, COPS atmospheric model. And I pulled together 
uh, interpretations of various different proxy records. So these are different local redox proxies that responds to what's happening on the shelf in the ocean. Um, so they're not really giving you a global picture, but it turns out if you have enough data from different locations over geological time, uh, we're talking hundreds or thousands of data points, you can start to detect a st significantly statistically significant shift in the proportion of oxic environments, um, and that shift occurs around the mid Paleozoic, so a little later than we previously thought. Um, when I started my PhD in 2011, there was a lot of talk about a neoproterozoic oxygenation event, um, but it now seems there wasn't really any appreciable permanent shift until until much later in Earth history. Um, this fits with the atmospheric model. It's also spitting out the same result. And we have very few direct proxies for what's going on in the atmosphere. Um, one is chromium isotopes, and they just tell us that around 800 million years ago, there was potentially um, a shift above a very low threshold, around 0.1 to 1% of present atmospheric levels. And then the wildfire record, um, which tells us when oxygen levels got high enough to trigger wildfires. Um, but of course, this proxy can't be used in the Precambrian where we don't have any forests. So that's the story from, from the local proxies. And then if we add in the global redox proxies, so these are things like um, uranium isotopes, which respond to the global proportion of seafloor that was covered by anoxic bottom waters, um, we see a very different story and we get some insight into what was happening in the Neoproterozoic and early Paleozoic before this um, shift towards higher oxygen levels. And the data are really all over the place. So they, you know, there's lots of different studies that have come out talking about oscillations and redox um, across this time period. And we wanted to see if we could actually line all of these up, if this data was just, you know, all over the place and nonsense, or if they were actually all um, coming together to tell us the same story about these oxygenation events and how frequent they were and how dramatic they were and, and um, whether they were occurring globally. So we, we think we could line up all of the data into a sensible framework um, that told us something consistent about these oxygenation events. But there's so much slack in the timings and the correlations between different cratons that equally, you know, you could come up with a different cartoon where these didn't line up. Um, so really, I think one of the key focuses at the moment is improving our understanding of the radiometric ages and the stratigraphy across this time period. Um, which I know um, a number of groups are, are doing some really good work on. Um, so that's the kind of context here. And the reason that we're also obsessed with what was happening with oxygen across this time period is because we have the first animal ecosystems emerging in the late Ediacaran. Um, and of course, animals are aerobic. So, you know, we know that they needed to breathe oxygen. How much oxygen did they need? How consistent did the environment need to be, you know, how persistent did the oxygenation need to be um, in order to develop complex ecosystems? Um, these are the kind of questions that we're exploring. So the Im images, uh, this is Namakalathus from the Nama group here and a, a, a 3D scan of cloud tubes from the Nama group, uh, which my PhD students working on Bontle. And some images of cloud reefs uh, from Amelia Penny's PhD and of course, uh, a lovely little trilobite um, from Zorovlev. Um, so in the Ediacaran we had, I'm not a paleontologist, and I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the, the rough story here, but we had very, uh, a small array of animals, including skeletal fauna that emerged in the Ediacaran that we term the Ediacaran biota. And then a little later on in the Cambrian explosion, we had sort of unequivocal emergence of um, lots of identifiable modern phyla. These Ediacaran forms are a little bit enigmatic, um, but we certainly have the tail and then the, the explosion of animal life across this time period, predating the shift towards stable oxic environments and in a time that appears to be actually rather turbulent. So the kind of questions that I'm interested in are how extensive were these oxic waters? We know there were some oxic environments at this time um, that have been ever since the GOE. So how extensive were they spatially? Where were they located? Uh, what was the maximum available oxygen concentration? Um, was it ever limiting? So, you know, surely there was enough to support, for example, a sponge. They can survive on very low oxygen concentrations, 10 micromoles. Was there enough to support uh, a fast moving um, skeletal carnivore? 
And how did oxygen availability shape the, the structure and the distribution and the success of early animal ecosystems? And yeah, these are questions that um, none of us have perfect answers to. And as time goes on, the answers are becoming sort of, it's, it's more and more complicated problem. Um, so one of the geochemical proxies that I use a lot is um, rare earth elements in seawater. So the rare earth elements are a beautiful proxy because they have a kind of built in um, checks and balances system. So the rare earths are the lanthanides, they're a suite of chemical elements that sit at the bottom of the periodic table, and they all have very similar chemical properties. Um, that's because as you add new electrons across the series, they actually enter a shell that's kind of inside, it's not one of the outer electron shells, so their reactivity doesn't change much across the series. So in seawater, what we see is this kind of nice smooth pattern with a gradual enrichment and concentration in the heavier rare earths. That's because they form complexes with carbonate ions, which leads to them being more stable, which leads to them being scavenged less efficiently um, onto particulates. And so the concentration is, is a little higher in seawater. So we have this nice smooth gradient um, as our sort of background to the rare earths. And then there's a number of anomalies within the pattern. Um, so lanthanum and gadolinium, for example, are just because the electron shells are empty and half filled respectively. So they're a little bit more stable than their neighbors. Um, we often include yttrium, which isn't a rare earth um, for comparison, and that when you stick that in the series, it forms a positive anomaly. And small europium anomalies are also present in seawater um, because Euro europium has redox chemistry under uh, very reducing conditions. So hydrothermal fluids, for example. Um, and thankfully, carbonate minerals appear to preserve the seawater rare earth element pattern with very little um, fractionation. So if we can extract the suite of rare earth elements from carbonate minerals, or carbonate rocks, um, these features can be used to confirm the preservation of a seawater and the extraction of a seawater to the exclusion of all other phases. So other phases have very different rare earth element signals. Um, clay minerals, for example, have much higher concentrations, they're, they're very flat and they have a small europium anomaly. Um, Iron and manganese oxides often have a reverse image of the seawater signal. Um, poor waters, river waters, again, have distinct patterns. So when we extract the rare earth elements, we can compare um, with the, the distinct distribution patterns from various minerals, and we can reassure ourselves that what we're looking at is a seawater signal which has been extracted from a pristine um, carbonate sediment. So, where this gets interesting is because one of the rare earth elements, cerium, has redox chemistry under ambient ocean conditions. So negative cerium anomalies develop um, in oxic waters and then are eroded in um, suboxic or anoxic waters. So this cartoon gives you an idea. We have, uh, it's very closely tied to the cycling of manganese. We have the oxidation of manganese 2 plus 2 manganese 4 oxides. Then we have the sorption of cerium-3 onto the surface where it goes, undergoes oxidation to cerium-4 oxide um, solid particles. And because cerium is being removed into the solid phase, the remaining residual seawater in the, in the local environment is depleted in cerium, uh, giving us what we term a negative cerium anomaly. So this just means if we calculate where cerium should be compared to its neighbors, based on this predictable smooth slope. Um, and then we measure where cerium actually is. If it's lower than where it's predicted, that's a negative cerium anomaly. So it's depleted in seawater. And then when we go um, beneath the chemocline into the manganese zone, we have the reductive dissolution of manganese oxides and that releases the manganese and the excess cerium back into the water column or into the pore waters. So typically with depth in seawater, you have the buildup of a negative anomaly, and then below the chemocline, you have um, either a return to values of around one or even a positive anomaly where you have local enrichment of cerium um, just below the boundary. So one thing that makes cerium special is that it's tied to the cycling of manganese rather than iron or sulfur. Um, as far as I know, 
most of our other marine redox proxies are tied to the cycling of iron and sulfur, and so they can only detect the difference between fully anoxic conditions and oxic conditions. And oxic may mean one micromole of oxygen. It could be it could be um, you know teeny tiny amounts of oxygen are enough to oxidize iron two to iron uh, three. Whereas the cycling of manganese uh, occurs under suboxic conditions, and it can actually even overlap with um, levels of oxygen as high as uh, 10 micromole or even more. So these cartoons um, just show you some, some real data from modern environments to help illustrate this. Um, so on the left, we have Lake Vanda, which is an ice covered lake in Antarctica, which has stratification at depth. And in blue, we have the oxygen levels. Um, I think they're about 0.4 millimolars at the surface. And at around 66 meters, they start to decline um, towards zero. And at the same time, the concentration of manganese two in pink starts to increase. And then we have the buildup of hydrogen sulfide um, as well, shown by the yellow triangles. So we're clearly crossing over a chemocline here and we're seeing the reductive dissolution of manganese oxides. And if we look at the rare earth element patterns from um, two levels, 66 meters, and where we still have uh, 0.25 millimolar of oxygen, and then 67 meters where we're in, we're in anoxic conditions and we have the buildup of manganese too. Uh, you can see at the bottom here, we flipped from a negative cerium anomaly to a positive cerium anomaly in, in the space, space of one meter. And the rest of the pattern looks pretty similar, so you still have your positive yttrium um, anomaly. And Another example on the right hand side is the Cariaco Trench, um, so a very different environment. And again, you have the decrease in oxygen down to about 220 meters. And then we have an intermediate zone where we have the buildup of manganese and iron too. Uh, and then eventually fully anoxic conditions and, and the buildup of hydrogen sulfide. And again, if we look at the rare earths from 256 meters, we have a large negative cerium anomaly and if we look at 327 meters, when we're well into the manganese zone, we have an enrichment or a positive cerium anomaly. Um, unfortunately, I don't think there's any higher resolution data available from the study. The rare earths are a, a lower resolution than the rest of the data. Um, right, so what we're seeing again and again is that cerium is responsive to the cycling of manganese and often um, the onset of manganese conditions precedes the onset of ferruginous and sulfitic conditions and even overlaps with low levels of oxygen. Um, so my field sites are in the Nama group, which outcrops in southern Namibia and northern South Africa. Um, it's a large, uh, beautiful carbonate ramp system, which was deposited in the late Ediacaran, so 550 up to about 538 million years ago. Um, it contains many soft-bodied Ediacaran biota, as well as some of the first skeletal fossils. Um, a lot of the sort of um, classical work on the skeletal fossils comes out of the Nama group. And also a, a, a number of microbial um, reef ecosystems. So these photos are from on the left from the South African field sites, um, which we were able to visit during the border closures in 2020 and 2021, which was nice. It's about a six hour drive from our department. Um, there's a series of bright red ash beds here, many of which have been dated by Emmy Smith and Mel Nelson. Um, there's large, beautiful microbial domes. We've got ooids, um, sedimentary structures, fossils. And then these on the, the bottom here are examples of the skeletal fossils that um, have been found across Namibia. So I worked on the NAMA group since my PhD, um, and Rachel Wood really collected this huge sample set from nine different sites uh, that represent different water depths across a shelf to basin transect. And together with a, a big group of collaborators, we collected um, lots of geochemical data. So we have iron speciation and cerium anomalies from um, all of the, the carbonate and siliciclastics from these sites. And we combined the data sets together and were able to make a sort of unique interpretation that where the iron speciation gave an oxic signal, 
but we had a positive serum anomaly that we must be in the intermediate manganese zone above the onset of ferruginous conditions, but below the manganese chemokine. Um, so this is all um, published in, in 2016. Um, and this is, this is how we're interpreting that in a sort of qualitative schematic sense, um, that there was this thick intermediate manganese layer um, where you had the cycling of cerium and manganese, and then below that, a anoxic ferruginous zone. And we have very nice rare earth element patterns with all the hallmarks marks that you would expect to see of a seawater signal, positive yttrium, positive lanthanum, uh, gentle slope towards the heavy rare earths. And we had, quite surprisingly, actually, a huge number of positive cerium anomalies. Um, so these aren't always present in the rock record. Um, we also interpret the absence of a serum anomaly to indicate anoxic conditions often, but a positive serum anomaly is sort of really um, positive evidence, if you like, for um, the onset of manganese conditions. So this um, shows how we've interpreted those two data sets together, um, with green being local ferruginous conditions, purple being local manganese, and blue indicating local oxic conditions. Uh, and we overlaid the biotic record on top of the geochemical data, and a very interesting pattern emerged. So what we found was that um, the distribution of skeletal fauna was really nicely explained by these two geochemical data sets. Um, Skeletal fauna are pretty much restricted to oxic environments. Um, and where we have persistently well oxygenated environments, so the pinnacle reefs and Dredon Vlakta, that's where we start to see larger skeletons, soft bodied biota um, burrows, and sort of persistent long lived communities and, and evidence for things like um, reef building. So, Clydina cementing directly to one another, forming uh, reefs and at the pinnacle reefs up here, we have um, some of the most sort of beautiful complex um, ecosystems and relationships that have been described in the NAMA group. Um, whereas if you look at a site like BRAC, um, which was persistently anoxic, we don't find any skeletal fossils there. And if we look at um, a site such as um, Omkirk, it's mostly anoxic. There was brief periods um, where it was locally well oxygenated and those periods are where we find the skeletal fossils. So this is a really nice explanation for the distribution of fossils. It suggests that oxygen is certainly important at controlling the distribution of animal fossils on the basin scale. Um, but one thing that puzzled me about this data set, a sort of lingering, um, niggling thing that bothered me at the end of my PhD was that we found lots of positive anomalies, but we found very few negative anomalies. Um, we did find a couple, and they were exactly where I would expect them to be. So we found a nice negative anomaly at Threed on Blackter and at the Pinnacle Reefs in some of the most persistently well oxygenated environments with the most complex um, animal ecosystems. But there were very few. And just, you know, in a very simple thought experiment sense, if you've got lots of positive anomalies, you must have lots of negative anomalies. So what we're looking at is the, um, the fractionation of cerium between the solid phase and solution. And for cerium to be able to build up below the chemocline um, suggests that it must have been removed above. So you must have a corresponding sort of negative anomaly in another bit of the, the water column um, in order to build up a positive anomaly below the manganese chemocline. So if cerium wasn't fractionating at all, um, I would expect to find no negative or positive cerium anomalies anywhere. If it is fractionating, you expect to find negative anomalies in one part of the basin and positive anomalies in another. So there was a sort of imbalance here. Um, and I hypothesized that perhaps a good place to look for these negative anomalies might be the microbialites. So we have these beautiful, extensive microbial reefs in the NAMA group. Um, and of course, microbialites are formed by microbial mat communities, which contain cyanobacteria. And cyanobacteria are producing oxygen. This is literally the source of the oxygen in the ocean. Um, so what better place to look for our oxic cerium anomaly signals? Um, 
So microbialites are thought to form through a process of either trapping and binding or in situ precipitation. Um, so this cartoon um, shows one mechanism for their accumulation. You have a bacterial, a microbial MAC community containing a number of different metabolic processes. And the mat is sticky. It produces something called EPS. And this sticky film of mucus um, at nighttime perhaps gets bits of sediment from the surrounding water column or grains um, get trapped by this mucus. And then because these microbial MAC communities are photosynthetic, they want to reach up towards the light. So they have to form a new sticky layer on top of the sediment. And it builds up um, in layers in this way, in, in cyclical layers perhaps following day-night cycles or seasonal cycles. Um, this is the cartoon you'll often see in textbooks and in lecture notes. Um, I'm guilty of this too. This actually comes from my undergraduate lectures. Um, but actually, there isn't a huge amount of evidence for the trapping and binding mechanism in nature, um, in modern environments or in the rock record. Uh, where it is observed, it's often in shallow marine settings, um, usually with a tidal influence. But it seems that in situ precipitation is, is perhaps a more common mechanism. And this is um, direct precipitation of calcium carbonate in the micro environment surrounding the mat, um, potentially influenced by chemical changes caused by the, the byproducts of the metabolic activity of the microbes. Um, so they're obviously able to influence the, the local CO2 concentration and the alkalinity. Um, if we look at modern microbialites, um, they're quite rare today, so it's difficult to find good examples, but there are some beautiful examples in the Bahamas. Um, and thankfully, somebody's done some microelectrode profiling of oxygen concentrations through these thrombolytic mats. Um, so this data on the right hand side here. You can see that at the top of the mat at a depth of zero, we have oxygen concentrations of just above 200 micromoles. And that's what you would expect for bottom waters in the modern ocean um, in equilibrium with an atmosphere with 21% oxygen. But then as we go down into the map, um, by two millimeters depth, oxygen concentrations have increased to as high as 600 micromoles. Um, and then they decrease again with depth towards full anoxia, as you would expect to happen, I guess, in, with sediments in depth um, in the poor waters. But briefly, there's actually an increase in oxygen concentrations, which is um, being caused by these cyanobacteria in the microbial mats producing oxygen. We have another example, um, which is in many ways a better analog for our Precambrian environments. So this is data from Lake um, Fryxel, Fryxel in Antarctica. Um, this is a, an ice covered lake with stratification and anoxic bottom waters. So here we have a different scenario because the bottom waters, the oxygen concentration has reached zero. And yet we have photosynthetic microbial mats um, covering the floor of this lake. And again, microelectrode profiling through these microbial mats has revealed the oxygen concentrations build up as high as 50 micromoles per litre. Um, so for context, this is pretty high. It's enough to support um, animal, most animal communities. Um, so these were proposed as potential oases for, for Archean um, oxygen oases. And the two key factors required for the development of these oases are that oxygen production exceeds the local consumption and there's relatively slow transport of oxygen out of the mat. Uh, and of course, they're predicted to disappear in the winter um, when there isn't any sunlight to drive these microbial communities. I don't know if anyone's actually been back in the winter to test this, um, but presumably that's the case. So back to the Nama group. Um, the Nama group is full of beautiful microbial reefs. Um, these include horizons with sort of meter scale bioherms that extend for kilometers. Um, we have a whole range of fabrics and we also have beautiful domes that look just like um, Sharks Bay in Australia today. And there's, there's a large diversity of microbial fabrics just within this one, um, one basin. And here they're, they're clearly a very important part of the ecosystem. So that's a major difference with modern environments where reefs, microbial 
mats and reefs are sort of confined to these strange little marginalized environments. Um, the microbial reefs in the Noma group are also associated with some of the earliest animal fossils. Um, so this is an image from John Grotzinger's paper, Microbial Metazoan Reefs in 2005. Uh, and the little white arrows, I don't know if you can and see those, but there's some little white arrows that are pointing out the presence of um, metazoans within the thrombolite column and also within the intercolumn fill. And this simple bar chart just shows you the distribution of skeletal fossils by fasces, and you can see that they're very common in the thrombolites, uh, even compared to other fasces, grainstones, packstones, waxstones, and mudstones. Um, the skeletal fauna are, appear to be loosely attached to the accreting structures, um, so they're not frame building, they're, they're living a similar kind of lifestyle to the, the sponges in the Bahamian thrombolites. Um, so Claudina, for example, um, has been found attached by its shell parallel to the microbial substrate uh, and even partially embedded within it, um, whereas Nomocolathus is only ever found within the intercolumn film. And then there's another fauna, um, another species, Nomopoikia, which is, uh, has a close relationship with the reefs, but it's an encruster, um, so it's living in sort of Neptunian dikes within the microbial reefs. Um, so the relationship between the two is, is unknown, but perhaps animals were showing a preference for the, the sort of firm and sediment-free substrates that built the thrombolites, um, or perhaps something else was attracting them to the general vicinity of the reefs, um, such as a food source or elevated oxygen levels. So for our study, we have um, collected microbial carbonates from the NAMA group, and we want to test whether they were providing local oxygen oases within broadly low oxygen oceans. So there's, there's definitely oxygen around, but we're, you know, the, the oxygen levels in the atmosphere were much lower today than today, and there was a chemocline and ferruginous conditions impinging on the shelf. And we're searching for our negative serum anomalies, and we were hoping that this was a, a good place to look. So we're very lucky that we can drive to these field sites. Um, we were able to pick up sort of massive samples and stagger to the backy with them. Um, and then Aidan spent a long time, it wasn't straightforward working out how to saw and polish these massive samples. Um, so now we've got these beautiful polished surfaces. Um, there's really very nice preservation of the internal structures. Um, at the macro scale, the horizon that he sampled was um, a series of domes. At the MESA scale, um, the polished surface reveals columnar stromatolites with occasional branching, um, beautiful sort of harmonized lamina that you can trace across from one column to the next. And then at the micro scale and thin sections, they're composed of groomers, clots, and micrite and microspar. And um, altogether, he's interpreted these observations um, that these microbialites were deposited in the subtidal zone above storm weather wave base um, and occasionally in the deep intertidal zone influenced by tide and wave action. So Aidan's drilled along individual microbial lamina using a Dremel. Um, I think this was quite painstaking, you managed to collect just enough powder for us to do a sort of modified sequential digestion technique um, to target the carbonate phases at the exclusion of um, any other sort of minor clay minerals that might be around. Um, so we digested the powders and analyzed them via ICPMS for rare earth elements. So these are the data. Um, each of these patterns represents a different individual um, micro drilled sample and each plot represents a different sort of macro scale sample and these are all from just one um, horizon. So I think these data show um, very nice coherent seawater patterns. Um, we have all of the, the hallmarks of a seawater signal that I would hope to see. Um, smooth gradients, slight heavy rare earth enrichment, uh, positive yttrium, positive lanthanum, some uh, small European anomalies, some of them um, quite large. And 
In all of these samples um, from every microdrilled horizon, we don't have a single positive or negative anomaly. So if we compare with the bulk rock data from horizons all across the NAMA group, um, you can see the cerium anomalies span quite a wide range, um, all the way up to 2.3 and down to 0.8. Whereas in the microbial reefs, um, they cluster very tightly around one. So we explore a number of different um, explanations for this, um, why we aren't finding the negative anomalies that we were expecting or hoping to find in the microbial reefs. Um, firstly, that the stromatolites were potentially anoxic. So the, the stromatolites have, you know, irregular and complex surfaces. Um, they formed 3D topography on the seafloor and they would have modified the flow of water around them. Um, so they potentially created pockets of increased turbulence or regions protected from it. Um, and this could have allowed sort of stagnant waters to build up. So actually maybe, maybe the whole thing is reversed that microbial um, reefs weren't oxygen oases, but actually sort of regions of stagnant water within a broadly um, oxic ocean. So I don't think anybody's looked at how stromatolites specifically influence the flow of water around them, but I found this nice paper from a group in Australia published this year, um, looking at how coral reefs influence the, the flow of water um, in their surroundings. And they've done some numerical models and they've also done some really nice little experiments with 3D printed corals in a, um, a flume tank. And the two agree this plot on the right shows the, um, the flow velocity with um, height from the seabed and the gray area is the, the top of the, um, the corals. And you can see that um, the flow velocities within the coral reefs were dramatically reduced relative to those at the water surface um, due to the drag forces. So I imagine that stromatolite reefs would work in a very similar way and you would have um, perhaps a local decrease in flow velocity allowing, for example, more organic carbon loading in, in the vicinity and stagnant anoxic waters. Um, another possibility is that the stromatolites were anoxic because the microbial community didn't contain oxygenic cyanobacteria. We don't have any direct evidence for the presence of cyanobacteria in these particular microbial reefs. Um, and you can have microbial mats that are anoxygenic that don't contain any cyanobacteria. Um, I don't think we have any convincing evidence for this either way in the NAMA group, but given that we know cyanobacteria were present at this time and that they're usually present in modern microbial mats, I don't think it's a particularly compelling explanation. I mean, this isn't the Archean where the presence or absence of cyanobacteria is an open question. Um, they, were, they were definitely around. So um, another possibility is that the stromatolites, the local environment surrounding the stromatolites was oxic, but the signal hasn't been recorded by the rare earth element data. Um, so possibly microbialites aren't recording seawater or the, the rare earth element pattern of the surrounding waters. Uh, there's two possible reasons why this might be. Um, perhaps the EPS, that sticky substance that the microbial mats are producing, um, is altering the partitioning behavior at the rare earths, causing sort of strange bioaccumulation effects. Um, and perhaps we have, perhaps that the microbial carbonates did record seawater, but they've been impacted by diagenetic resetting. Um, I don't think this is the case. Um, modern microbialites record seawater patterns very well. These data are from a paper by Webb and Camber in 1999. This is the average of 52 samples from modern microbialites on Heron Island, um, on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And they found that while the microbial carbonates had higher partition coefficients than the surrounding skeletal carbonates, which is a good thing because um, you end up with higher concentrations in the carbonate that are more easy to detect with the ICPMS. Um, the partition coefficient was similar across the whole series of rare earth elements. So they were faithfully recording seawater. They weren't introducing or eliminating any um, 
any anomalies. Um, on the diagenesis front, rare earth elements have shown, been shown to be remarkably resistant to diagenetic alteration. Um, and this comes from a whole number of studies by different groups um, in different modern settings and in the geological record. And rare earth elements always seem to come out top. So even where other geochemical proxies are being compromised, um, rare earth elements seem to, to be remarkably robust. Um, so we're in, we're in big trouble if we can't trust. That doesn't mean to say that every rare earth element pattern from a carbonate rock in the rock record is recording a primary signal, obviously not. But um, on the whole, I'd say they're a relatively trustworthy um, geochemical proxy. Um, so perhaps the problem here is the spatial scale over which um, the microbial oxygen horizons are occurring. So microbial mats or microns or millimeters thick. Um, can cerium even fractionate and respond on such small spatial scales? And even if it does, does our big Dremel drill bit, even though we use the finest one um, we could, is it homogenizing these signals um, if they are indeed present? So I think cerium anomalies are capable of responding on very, very small spatial scales. Um, we saw that earlier in, in the data from Lake Vanda that there was a response on a meter scale. And this study by Dylan Wilmoth um, from last year demonstrates fractionation of cerium on the sort of hundreds of micron scale in a, a microbial mat environment from the Archean. So it's certainly possible that these signals were being produced um, over the short, the, these short kind of distances of a couple of millimeters. So in this study, uh, the Wilma study, he actually shows um, remarkably negative and corresponding positive cerium anomalies in two different phases. It's not a carbonate environment, um, but it is a, a microbial mat lacrostrine environment. Um, and across sort of paleo oxygen bubbles, he shows a gradient in cerium from, from negative to positive um, that also correlates with the manganese concentrations. So it's a really nice, really nice study. Um, we have some preliminary laser ablation um, data from our microbial samples as well. Um, Answer and K is currently processing all of that in, in Iolite, but the preliminary data that we have show that there are also no positive or negative cerium anomalies in the laser ablation data. Um, and that's on a, a much finer scale. I think the aperture was between 40 and 120 microns. Um, so another possibility that we've considered is that there was insufficient oxygen being produced in these mats to trigger the fractionation of cerium. So perhaps they were oxic, but the oxygen produced just um, wasn't sufficient for manganese and cerium oxidation. Um, so firstly, just for general context, um, you know, we do see the fractionation of cerium in the Ediacaran. So perhaps in earlier parts of the rock record, it may have been the case that we had oxic environments, but oxygen levels were, you know, one to 10 micromoles, and we didn't actually generate cerium anomalies. But by the Ediacaran, we know that at least in parts of the ocean, there was sufficient oxygen to generate large um, negative cerium anomalies. So these data are from Ling Kong Fei's paper, um, from South China, and he showed cerium anomalies as low as 0.4, um, developing in strata that are contemporaneous with the Nama group. And of course, we also have positive anom anomalies all throughout the Nama group. So we know that there must have been sufficient oxygen somewhere to fractionate cerium, um, just perhaps not in the, in the microbial mats. Um, if we look to the, the modern studies from like Freixel, can't pronounce that, maybe someone can correct me afterwards. Um, we can see that even below an anoxic water column, oxygen levels build up to as high as 50 micromoles of O2, and this should be sufficient to produce a negative cerium anomaly. Um, I don't know if anyone's actually profiled rare earths through an environment like this, that would be fascinating. Um, but if we assume that the cyanobacteria in the Ediacaran microbial mats were equally as efficient 
as the ones in modern environments, then I think um, I'm, I'm very convinced that there would have been enough oxygen around to trigger the fractionation of cerium. Um, so a final possibility is that the stromatolites, the local environment around the stromatolites was oxic, but the calcium carbonate that we're analyzing actually records the surroundings, um, which were potentially anoxic. So it's, it's difficult to say, but there is mixed evidence in our thin sections um, for sort of some agglutination and some in situ precipitation. Uh, Aidan concluded that both of these processes were occurring in the NAMA group. Um, so perhaps if you have this mechanism of um, stromatolite growth and these particles are actually precipitating elsewhere in the water column and then being bound to the stromatolite, they're not going to re reflect the local microenvironment, they're going to reflect the surroundings. And we know that at times within the NAMA group, there were ferruginous and manganous waters impinging on the shelf. Um, and I don't see why you couldn't have anoxic surroundings um, with an oxic microbial mat and carbonate particles being brought in from those anoxic surroundings to the reef. Um, within this plot of all the, the individual data that I showed earlier, the black lines are actually from the intercolumn material. And you can see in every case, the intercolumn material shows the same rare earth element patterns as um, the microbial columns. So that perhaps um, could be more evidence that the carbonate in the columns is, is sourced from the surrounding environment because they have um, exactly the same rare earth element pattern. Um, and of course, you know, we have to just consider the, the kind of where the carbonate precipitation is occurring here as well. Perhaps we do have oxygen buildup on the millimeter scale, but if the carbonate precipitation um, is capturing the rare earth signals from one or two millimeters below, then we're going to see an, an anoxic signal and just sort of miss this um, small millimeter scale oxic horizon entirely. Um, so moving into the future, um, my group is continuing to work on this and we want to expand this to a range of microbial fabrics from various depths across the NOMA group. Um, there's a whole variety of fabrics and perhaps some of them do contain negative cerium anomalies. Maybe we just got very unlucky um, and picked some that were from below the local chemocline or whatever. Um, and we want to in particular target microbial reefs that have evidence of in situ metazoans. And then also expand this kind of work across the geological record. Obviously, microbial carbonates are abundant throughout the, um, the Proterozoic. Um, so just very briefly, my PhD student, Anson K is also working on microbial carbonates from the Transvaal supergroup, uh, which are in a very different setting just before the GOE. And we have a whole variety of just spectacular microbial fabrics all at one locality, Hamahana Hill. Uh, including these microbial roll-up structures. So this is where uh, microbial mats covering the seafloor have created a sort of sticky semi-consolidated surface that can be flipped over backwards and forwards. So it's not um, cemented, it's not brittle enough to break, but it's not loose, unconsolidated sediment. Um, this is evidence that it's being bound by microbial mat layers. So he's also doing micro-drilling and um, laser ablation to look at the rare earth element patterns in these microbial carbonates. And there's a very different context here because we have a fully anoxic atmosphere and potentially um, fully anoxic oceans with, with no cyanobacteria present. Um, although obviously that's, that's a major open question. Um, yeah, well, thank you to my group. Um, this is McDonald, um, who's just produced a strontium isotope record through the NAMA group, um, just graduated recently. Uh, Aidan, who did most of this work on the microbial carbonates, and uh, Wendy, a paleontologist at UCT, uh, as well as Bontelay, Jess, Ansa, and um, Joseph. Yeah, so, um, yeah, thanks for listening, and yeah, hope you have some questions. Thanks, Rosalie, that was really good. Um, uh, we, we're going to go ahead and switch over to our uh, discussions and questions. Um, we have a couple that were sent in the, uh, 
in the chat earlier and you already have a couple of hands, just let me know if you need to go. We don't usually cut this at any certain point. Um, so the first question coming from K. Sunder Sarwan, does the magnitude of positive cerium anomalies at a particular location also correspond to the number of biomineralizing forms in that location? And are there any evidence for mutualistic interactions between microbialites and biomineralizing forms, especially any, any qualitative differences between biomineralizing and associate association with microbialites and those which are not associated. Rosalie, I think you're I'll ping you to unmute. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Um, so the first question was, is there any evidence that the magnitude of the positive anomaly correlates with the local distribution of biota? I think so, yeah. Correct? Yeah. Yes. Um, sorry, I can't see the chat. Maybe I can get that up. Yeah, it's okay. No, it's this one was sent directly to me. I can these okay. are long questions. So um hey sender, I'm going to go ahead and just put them, send them to every, uh to the meeting so Rosalie can read them. Herself. That would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um so I would be very cautious about interpreting the magnitude of an anomaly. I think it's potentially capturing interesting information. Um, but I don't think we No, I, I certainly haven't seen any correlation in the NAMA group. Um, the positive anomalies actually indicate where you're below the chemocline, so we don't have any um, skeletal fauna in those locations. Um, and as I said, we don't have very many negative anomalies at all, so there's no way I could sort of start to draw conclusions there. Um, yeah, I would be I would be cautious of doing that. Potentially in the future, that could be a really interesting um, angle to actually look at the magnitude of positive and negative anomalies throughout the rock record and how they correlate with oxygen levels. I'd actually love to do some um, sort of glove box experiments. I have a glove box at UCT um, where you can actually vary the oxygen levels and test um, experimentally how under different conditions the magnitude of the anomaly varies at, at, at different oxygen levels. Um, the second part of the question was are there any evidence for mutualistic interactions between microbialites and biomineralizing forms? Um, not as far as I know. I'm not an expert on that. I th I'm not sure if there's been any substantial work on this since the Grotzinger's paper in 2005. Um, and in that paper, he didn't mention that the forms that were in the reefs were different morphologically from the forms that weren't in the reefs. And I think he suggests actually that a lot of them, are, you know, have been living elsewhere and then swept into the intercolumn fill. So they're in the surrounding environment. Um, and there's actually only limited evidence for skeletal fauna that are living embedded within the microbial columns. Um, yeah, I'm not aware of any, any evidence for that. Okay. Thanks. There's another one from Kay Sunder, but let's go around. Um, Greg Retallick has his hand up next. Please go ahead and unmute yourself. Well, that was oh, that that was really great, Rosalie. I enjoyed that very much. And um, I think you're really onto something. I don't know what exactly. Um, I did several hundred REE analyses of all sorts of Ediacaran materials, and there are not a single cerium anomaly, either positive or negative. But my main reason for putting my hand up was um, you, you indicated that you had trouble slabbing those big stromatolites. And I can imagine that would be a problem in most university settings. Um, I had a similar problem when I wanted to slab entire paleosol profiles and polish mm -hmm. them. And the solution was to take them to a commercial tombstone polisher. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a couple of hundred bucks and they do a fantastic job. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we we looked into all kinds of options, actually. And in the end, um, he used an orbital sander, um, which I think was quite painstaking. It was a few days sort of locked in the basement, covered in dust. But Oh, yeah, awful. Uh, that's, that, that, nice. that, that's, that's actually what the commercial people use, too. But um, yeah. you don't have to deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's only a few hundred, a few hundred bucks. Yeah. Okay, anyway, very that's good to know. Thanks. Okay, great. Hedda Agich, you're next. 
Hello, thanks for a lovely talk, uh, Rosalie. That, that was really interesting. Um, so I was wondering about these potentially anoxic mats. Um, and I know these are carbonates, but is there, um, was there any organic matter preserved and associated with these uh, that you can analyze for 13C, just to try and see a signature of metabolism that might be there, um, you know, to test whether they're actually uh, photosynthesizers or whether there's anything like uh, metanotrophy going on? Um, yeah, I think that would be um, super interesting. We have some carbon and oxygen isotopes from, from the carbonate, but we haven't tried extracting um, isotopes from the organic carbon. I think that would be a really nice honors project um, next year. But is there usually any organic matter preserved um, with these things? Well, yeah, I mean, TOC contents throughout the NOMA group are extremely low, so that might prove difficult. And I think what you'd you'd probably have to do something like um, homogenize a huge amount of powder, and then it probably wouldn't end up telling you very much. Yeah, it might be a nice exploratory honors project. Um, but yeah, we haven't seen preservation of any substantial amount of organic carbon. And I know the sort of bulk rock TOC is is very low throughout, like below sort of 0.1%. So yeah. Thanks. Okay, let's go ahead. Um, Kaysen, let's um, get Kay Sender's other question. And I'm going to just go ahead and send it right to the main chat. And then I'll read it aloud for the video. There was some work regarding fluid dynamics and the position of Ernietta morphs that was quite important in Ediacaran ecosystems. Do you suggest any sort of physical segregation between stromatolite, by distance between stromatolites of different height and composition that would have led to interesting water flows, possibly corresponding to, port, uh, to presence of metazoan inst instances in a fossil bed? Um. Physical segregation by distance between stromatolites of different heights and composition. Yeah, um, so I think, is that the work from the group at the Natural History Museum in Oxford? Um, I think I've seen some of that. So they do really interesting models of how fluid flow would have been influenced by the shape of the Ediacaran biota themselves, and perhaps how that would have influenced the feeding um, mechanisms. Um, perhaps they're the best people to, to sort of investigate this for the, the microbial um, reefs, perhaps they're already doing that. Um, I would love to as well sort of serial section, use serial sectioning techniques on these microbial lights to get a really nice 3D model. Um, and then perhaps when you've got a 3D model, you can you can print that and you can do flume experiments and you can also do numerical modeling of um, how the flow would have been influenced. So do I suggest any Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that because we have this whole diversity of different um, stromatolite morphologies in the NOMA group, I mean, there's, there's a huge range that each of those would have had a different influence on water flow. I can't predict exactly which morphology would have had which impact. I think that needs to be modeled by someone who understands fluid dynamics. Um, yeah, and it would be it would be really interesting to see if there's a correlation between the morphology of the microbialites and the distribution, the presence or absence of metazoans in that particular reef, for sure. Um. Okay, um, maybe I can ask some a question next. Um, I thought that was really interesting, Rosalie. I am actually particularly, uh, maybe you showed or discussed it and I missed it, but Man iron and manganese concentrations in these. Um, what are those concentrations? And do you have petrographic evidence that the iron and manganese in them would be in carbonate minerals or oxide minerals? Um, I don't think I showed that in this talk. I don't want to say a number off the top of my head for the iron and manganese concentrations, but we do have... Um, I think the iron and manganese that we are detecting um, through ICP are located in the carbonate minerals as Fe2 and, and manganese 2. Um, that's for two reasons. Firstly, because um, in sort of petrographic screening, we're not seeing any substantial um, oxide minerals. 
and also because we've used a sequential digestion technique that's specifically designed to exclude those minerals during the digestion process um, and all of the other the trace elements and you know things like aluminium and the rare earth element patterns themselves suggest that what we were extracting in our digest um, was only the carbonate fraction and so any iron and manganese that was in there is likely to be also from the, the carbonate minerals yeah that's interesting i wonder if you know and i wonder if you're just not seeing it because you're not looking at the oxides um yeah. if yeah um you well, also they would have, have a positive a positive anomaly i guess right because that's where that the serum makes sense for going manganese, right? into the oxides and then seawater would be negative so the carbonates would record the negative signal that's true so it'd be interesting to see if they both don't record it actually the the manganese content in the bulk rock data the manganese content is higher in the samples with um, positive serum anomalies, which is what you would expect if they were precipitating from manganese waters. Um, right. Below the chemo okay. Yeah. I also think something that I've struggled in some of my samples is sometimes is where we have middle rare earth enrichment, and it looks like you might have some of this middle rare earth enrichment in yours. Is that true? How do you read that data? Um, what do you? What could you comment on that? Um. Yeah, I don't think we have substantial middle rare earth enrichment, but so in seawater, there's quite a lot of heavy rare earth enrichment. And then data from modern carbonate minerals shows that that gradient is suppressed slightly during calcium carbonate precipitation. So you should still see slight heavy rare earth enrichment, but it's not going to be on the same scale as um, what we see. In, I'm not sharing my screen anymore, am I? I'm just flicking through. Oh, no, myself. you're not. You're not. Yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned what that. happened there. Um, yeah, we don't have substantial heavy rare earth enrichment, um, but we don't have middle rare earth enrichment. I think that comes from digestion of phosphate minerals commonly. They have this kind of the bell-shaped index, this kind of shape. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you think there was substantial phosphate cycling going or phosphorus cycling going on to cause uh, enrichment? No, I don't think there is. I don't, don't think there is phosphate in these samples. And I don't think we have middle rare earth enrichment in these samples. But if okay. you do have it in your samples, that mm -hmm. might be an explanation. Okay. Um, okay. You also have a strongly positive europium anomaly there, it looks like. Um, and uh, do, so that would, if you have a whole lot of um, reducing fluids coming from a hydrothermal source where you might be getting this europium anomaly, um, you could be overwhelming the situation with a lot lower or over overwhelming the environment with reducing conditions that aren't really conducive to manganese precipitation. Um, sure. Do you think that's a topic to yeah. explore more? Um, there is, I mean, a, a lot of, you'd expect a small positive europium anomaly in oxic seawater. Um, where you have extremely large europium anomalies, for example, in BIFs, it's been argued for you know local influence of hydrothermal fluids on the shelf. Um, some of ours are getting up there. They're kind of, I wouldn't say they're like exceptional, like the ones you find in the Archean. Um, but we did notice those and, and discuss them. And you know, is there something significant there with the the large europium? Um, I think that's perfectly possible, and it would just kind of fit into that idea. I discussed that the surrounding water column was anoxic, and so even if you have um, an oxic microenvironment within the microbial reefs, um, if the calcium carbonate is precipitating in the surroundings, it's just going to record the anoxic conditions um, in the in the broader water column on the shelf, um, and they may well may well have a slightly larger europium anomaly if they're being influenced by upwelling ferruginous. Um, hydrothermal waters. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, we don't have any more questions, but well, maybe we can... uh, I can ask uh, Rosalind nice talk. Uh, I was, uh, could you expand on uh, sort of the stagnant conditions? Because uh, it seems to me like if you have stagnant conditions and you produce locally oxygen, it's actually would help to develop a strongly oxidizing conditions rather than kind of would be uh, 
obstacle for it? Um, yes, potentially, I guess, because what you need for the oxic conditions to build up is slow movement um, out of that out of the local area. So, yeah, it could potentially go either way, I guess. It would just be a sort of battle between, you know, the organic carbon loading and the ability of the microbial reefs to produce oxygen. And so actually, I think by this time, the most substantial source of oxygen was probably um, phytoplankton and cyanobacteria living freely in the surface waters. And so maybe, and, and if, the, if the atmospheric oxygen was high enough, then the waters in contact um, with the atmosphere at the surface would have higher oxygen concentrations than would be produced locally in a microbial mat at the bottom of an anoxic lake, so 50 micromoles of O2. Um, and that's, of course, only occurring on a, um, a millimeter scale. So whether those mats are able to produce enough oxygen to influence their surroundings um, versus the organic carbon loading from the microbial mats themselves and stuff raining down from above. I, I don't know. I guess that's something to be, yeah, worked out with the model. It's, uh, another question following on the European anomaly. Do you have mm -hmm. any indication from geology that there is a strong like volcanic submarine volcanic activity nearby that could be responsible for European anomaly? Um, no, I don't think there's any geological evidence for that. Um, as I said, the European anomalies are quite high, but I don't think they're high enough. I don't think they're outside the realm of the, the sort of spectrum of things we see in normal seawater. You know, I don't think we have to invoke some kind of strange extreme so, reducing hydrothermal fluid here. They're only sort of in, in the order of, you know, two. Two is pretty big. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like uh, Alex has in his granular information, so I think everything below two. Uh, so for Ken, it would be small, but for okay. Paleoprotrazoic or Protrazoic. Yeah, they are. Well, I mean, it's only in a couple of samples as well. So like the top left. So most of them, I mean, the European anomalies are uh, completely reasonable. And then there was a couple, and we obviously considered, you know, issues with barium and I don't think it's that. So I think they are real. Um, yeah. I mean, perhaps that's linked to the, the whole story about the surrounding anoxic waters um, and where they're coming from. Yeah, I always I also wonder if this smaller European anomaly can just occur from sort of washing it out via mixing with shallow, you know, with more terrestrial water fluxes. So maybe it's just muted and it should be it would be larger larger if you were preserving it, for example, in deep water settings equivalent to a banded iron formation setting. Mm -hmm. um, but oh yeah, Kun. Kuhn in the chat just mentioned, is there a co-variation between barium and European anomalies, but you just mentioned not. No. Um, I guess I have a question that's maybe more broad, not directly related to your data, but you discuss a little bit about, you know, how the really, you showed some really high um, concentrations of oxygen in my, like modern microbial mats, like up to 700 micromolar. Um, and so, to my understanding from working with with iron and the iron isotope system, when you have really high, locally really high concentrations of, of oxygen, you can quantitatively precipitate all iron, and uh, you, don't, you don't cause fractionation of iron isotopes. Do you think that this could be extrapolated to quantitative precipitation of sort of cerium with manganese oxides in local really high oxygen um, environments where cerium is just simply not fractionated because you have such high oxidizing concentration uh, or high, high oxid ox oxygen concentrations uh, that you're just so rapidly precipitating oxides? 
Um, I guess it's very different to an isotope si system. So, I mean, if you just had full precipitation of the cerium, you would still see a massive negative cerium anomaly in, in the remaining water column, which right. is what I'd okay. expect to see in the carbonates. So yeah, it's, you know, it's very different to a, an isotope signal, but that's very interesting um, about the ion isotopes. I didn't know that. Mm. Um, it's interesting too. I don't know if, if they're in the Bahamas where you have oxic bottom waters, you get up to 650 micromoles of O2 in the mat. And then in the lake where you have anoxic bottom waters, you only get up to 50 micromoles of O2. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there's obviously going to be some variation between different microbial mats and how efficient they are and all kinds of variables controlling how much oxygen is produced and how much remains in the mat. Um, I don't know if there's, it's interesting that there's a kind of 400 micromole jump in the open ocean and only a 50 micromole jump in the, the lake with anoxic bottom waters. Um, yeah, so I don't know, I don't know what we would expect in the Archean microbial mats if they were, if they did contain cyanobacteria and they were producing oxygen, um, whether they would have been as efficient as the modern day mats. Right. Yeah. They would need a lot of nutrients. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I don't have anything else in the chat for you or on my list of questions, so um i'll leave it for just a few seconds if anybody wants to speak up it just seems like uh sonoma was in a fallen basin and obviously was a lot of volcanism at that time that's why you have ashes so potentially mm. you could have also submarine volcanism that would uh, provide iron and manganese and kind of uh, reductants to a basin so. Um, sure, yeah, you're right. There was um, there's a, a large number of ash beds, particularly in the near shore settings. And then, um, so including the Orange River where our samples came from, there's actually um, quite frequent ash beds. Um, so yeah, it's clearly a very active system. Um, and I mean, across the for context across the whole planet at this time, there was frequently anoxic bottom waters on the shelf. So that's that's nothing exceptional, but we know there must have been oxic waters. And the question is, where were they, right? If we're seeing clear evidence of oxygen in the atmosphere, the surface waters must have been oxygenated. We're seeing positive anomalies from below the chemocline. So um, where were the oxic waters located? And we're struggling to really find good evidence for that in the NOMA group, sort of eluding us. <laughs> <laughs> okay great it seems like everybody's satisfied thanks a bunch rosalie that was a really great talk and a lot of great discussion yeah thanks everyone yeah and thanks everybody for being here see you all in weeks to come take care thanks alex